tear it falls and hits the ground A tree it falls without a sound Bird it calls and sends you home A man he sits in the cold all alone Hi, welcome to the Joy of Sunflowers. Uh, you're about to watch an interview with me and Meg. I hope you enjoy. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. How are you feeling? You're uh, getting close to your date, right? I'm, I'm 22 weeks, but um, oh. I, feel, I feel like how most um, women feel when they're pregnant after loss. Just kind of. Yeah. Day at a time. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was very shocked at that. I didn't expect it, but um, yeah, I've had, I've had a few scans and a few things and I just sort of sat there feeling numb and, you know, they, they looked at the scan. I looked at the baby, it was moving and stuff. And I just kind of was like, like, that's great. But, you know, yeah. I don't know if I'm taking it home. So <laughs> it's, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Oh, like a, I'll believe it when when we're there, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just not not real until until it comes home, really. But yeah. um, yeah. There's um, there's quite a few ladies that uh, I've been speaking to who have um, who have gotten pregnant, and then there's quite a few ladies who who haven't and still waiting. Uh, so it's been. A real mixed bag. There's been a lot of tears, <laughs> so I can't promise you there won't be in this one. Uh, but I'm extra for There you go. Yeah, absolutely. So, how have you been? I've been okay. I've been okay. Yeah, uh, day at a time. Similarly, you know, uh, definitely uh, try to go with the process of. Uh, rather than thinking too far ahead, just what are we focused on today? And what does today look like? Yeah. And that helps me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of, you know, knowing where you're at right now and, and accepting that so that you can kind of keep moving towards anything. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not getting stuck in thought of, you know, what's not happening or what could happen that's like not good. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's too overwhelming to think about what's next because we've seen too much of, you know, what happens. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I wish, like, I wish we, like, could know, like, ri li like, the risk so that if it does happen, like, there's an understanding. We know there's a whole community, but still, like, really enjoy it. But I don't... Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't... Uh, yeah. You can't have both. Yeah, I, I think we'd, uh, we'd make such different decisions if we knew with certainty how they'd end up oh yeah yeah, yeah. It'd be easier to spend the money too <laughs> <sighs> yeah yeah hindsight is uh <laughs> absolutely it could be yeah. good but it can also be really annoying <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um but thank you so much for being here yeah uh, and thank you for rescheduling last minute i'm sorry about last week um, i'm looking forward to chatting today yeah, is your dog okay? She's she's home. She's doing better. Um, we have to see a cardiologist to really know the extent, and that won't be for a few weeks because they're not common. Uh, you know, there aren't a lot of dog cardiologists <laughs> in the area. Uh, so you know, she but she's home and she's on a medication that's supposed to keep her stable until we do that. Um, but it was yeah, it was a scare, and she's a bit older, but she's not that old or maybe it's just in my head that she's not that old <laughs> the vet you know kind of said he's like well it's coming at this age and I was like but she's a puppy and he's like she's not <laughs> um no. but we you know I just kind of kept saying to her I'm like not this year Tonks <laughs> this is not the year <laughs> uh, but like, it is, it's just good to have her home you know she had to spend the night there and that was awful it was terrible and it's scary and you you know, like a baby, you can't tell them what's going on. You can't explain to them why you're leaving them there or what's happening. And so there's also that guilt of, 
you know, she's scared. She doesn't know what's happening. She doesn't know why we're walking away from her right now. Um, so having her home is, is really been good. Yeah. 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 Yeah, She's sitting on my lap right now so that she doesn't bark at the squirrels while we're chatting. (laughs) Cute. Is she, she, I'm guessing she's quite small. She's not like a big. She is. Yeah. Yeah. She's about 15 pounds. Okay. So that's why you're like, but she's still a puppy. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) When they're like little and you're like, but they're always little. (laughs) I know. I know. (laughs) Oh no, it's, it's, yeah, I think we we grow attached to our our pets because they become part of the family, uh-huh. and you know we want them around forever. And unfortunately, they don't live as long as we do. It's unfair. It's the worst. Yeah, it's absolutely the it's the most unfair part. I mean, yeah. you could try and get a pet that will live probably outlive you. I I think the next one has to be a turtle or something. Yeah, it well, has so, to be. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you could. I was thinking, I was thinking like a pet that you can't have as a pet, like a shark. Like sharks. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll look into it. I'll look into it. <laughs> I've been for like forever. So you could get a pet shark, you know? Uh, that's the, that'll be, if anybody, if any, anybody wonders why we're trying to find a place with a pool, that's why. <laughs> yeah. Green, Greenland sharks apparently live, this, apparently they think they live for like 400 years. So. I don't know how they work that out or if that's true, but that's what we'll have. We'll have to find a, they'll have to go in the will or something. <laughs> yeah. And look after my pet shark. <laughs> <laughs> People would be very unhappy to find out that that's who we left them in the will. <laughs> yeah. 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 They'll be like, really? You couldn't have like, I don't know, like gotten rid of it first. Then- it cash. <laughs> yeah. Like cash for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it would turn into sushi if it wants its hand off. <laughs> we'll, find but, uh, we'll find out. <laughs> but uh, silliness aside, because yes. you know, we have real pets, so we can actually stroke. You can't do that with a shark. Uh, True. I mean, True. Uh, I'm sure Not someone's out there going, yes, you can. I've scuba dived and I've watched a shark. But yeah. There's there's something to be said about our little fluffy pets. I've got a dog. Um, I'm not overly keen on animals a lot of the time, like especially around kids. Like I always get worried about it. But um, I, it is nice. Like it's you feel like there's like a little bit of protection. Like mine gets scared at like everything, but he still barks. So mm. I'm like, well, he's still a warning sign, you know. Yeah. If something happens, he he'll bark and he'll let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, he'll bark at like the wrong things. I'm like, that's daddy. What are you doing? Stop it. <laughs> Freaking me out. <laughs> You're making me think there's some burglar or something, and it's like, <laughs> Dad, just shut up. <laughs> but um, yes. Obviously, I try and be really nice about it because he's just a dog and he doesn't know, but. Yeah, sometimes I will shout at him. So, yeah, yeah, they they are a bit like kids in that way. I'm going to shout at you because you're not listening. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I feel like a kid gets it more though, so it's even more frustrating with a dog. And I feel like I can spoil dogs a little more because I'm like, you know what? You never need to grow up and get a job. <laughs> so yeah. I'm just going to spoil you. Yeah. I'm, you know, I don't have to worry about you ever being self sufficient. You'll always have a home here. <laughs> You don't have to be a good person because you're no, a dog. You, totally. And I'm, I'm what, the only one that ever needs to like you. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what makes you a good dog is being ultra loyal and loving me so much. that <laughs> Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. you can only do that through, through treats and really like, you know, I'm the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My mom always comes over with treats and stuff and then the dog just pops oh. her everywhere. Like he's <laughs> in love with her. He likes, he'll sit there really patiently. Like <laughs> I've been really great, you know, Where's wagging his tail and everything. It's, it's hilarious. I love it. <laughs> Dogs are the best. Um, mm-hmm. Unlike cats. I had a cat before and she was. I agree. I I understand cats, but like I never wanted one because I don't want to have to earn love with a pet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard enough to earn love in real life like I am 
I am in, interested in the free love from a dog. <laughs> yeah, I've got to say, I don't hear many people saying like their pet, their pet cat is like a child, like their child. That's because true. <laughs> it's not. You can't. You can't get the same attachment from a cat. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, all you cat lovers out there, but you just no. Can't. I agree completely. They do they not don't... care if you're there or not. No, they just don't <laughs> love you the way a dog does. Um, dogs are so loyal and they just love you and they like you give them food and they're your best friend forever you give a cat food and she's like it wasn't what I wanted (laughs) that's so spot on (laughs) yeah and then they saunter off with their like Mm -hmm. you know exactly they're like oh are you sad I'm gonna go in the other room so I don't have to see it then (laughs) yeah the only thing you get from a dog is like wagging tail like because they're so excited but and that's what cat. I'm here for. <laughs> a cat, you get a saunter, like yeah, <laughs> attitude, sass. What's it? <laughs> anyway, you definitely don't get that from a young child. That they're, they're just yeah, happy true. to see you. They just want you. So, yeah, dogs. Dogs are the closest you can get. <laughs> I think I for agree. pets, pets wise. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, go for a turtle if you want something that will live yeah. longer. I mean, I had a turtle or a shark. One, one of the two. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're not they're not as like fuzzy and playful, but they're still playful. I've, I've my sister has turtles. Nice. <laughs> my dad has turtles too. It's funny. It's such a random pet, isn't it? It's, it's like... so random, but he loves them. It's like a thing. He's got like turtle figurines everywhere because I, it's a very bizarre thing. One day he just <laughs> decided turtles are his thing <laughs> nice I love it I love it um a lot of people say you know if you're planning on having kids you should get a dog first you know to like sort of not practice but like have something that is reliant on you and you've got to keep it alive right yeah because a lot of people say oh well I can't even keep a plant alive but there's a difference plants, between plants are harder plants don't tell you when they're hungry that's what I was plants gonna say very that's... tricky just if I haven't given them the right amount of water, they're like, okay, dead. Okay, done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some gardeners out there going, uh, plants do tell you in their leaves. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but <laughs> that's I'm true. With, I'm with you. So um before we sort of dive into your story, um, what what like why did you get a dog? Like what was your uh so I uh I've always had dogs. I I love having dogs when, um, but my husband has never had a pet at all before. Blows my mind. It's like, I often joke to him. I'm like, I wish I felt your love the way Tonks feels your love. <laughs> he just loves her so much. Um, and we, you know, we specifically picked a dog that would be good with kids. And this was, you know, this was five years ago. But we always knew we wanted kids. And so we really looked into what are breeds that are good with kids. And, um, you know, we got her from a a rescue group, but she was older. She, we all, you know, she was housebroken already. She, uh, we knew this breed would be good with children. So there was definitely a lot of thought in mind. We didn't think it'd be five years before our dog knew what, you know, what it was like to live with a child. Uh, But there was a lot, you know, it was a lot of, planning around having a household of kids what type of dog we get yeah and I I think uh you know sometimes you have to do that um that extra planning like even if you don't know what the result will be but yeah you were saying um yeah that your husband didn't have any pets for his whole never had a pet growing up um and you know every time I said we should get a dog he kind of would say like he talked about the burden of it a lot. He's like, oh, then we, you know, one of us has to always make sure to get home. We have to get a dog walker. It's harder to take trips. And then you get it. And I have had dogs. So I've understood. I'm like, the love is so worth it. All of that is totally worth it. And now that we have one, I mean, I swear half of our conversations are just saying to each other, look at the dog, look at what the dog's doing. (laughs) It's like, uh, definitely, um, has been amazing to see him with her, his love of her, his taking care of her. Uh, and I did not see it coming. <laughs> yeah. I really thought he was just going to be a bystander in this pet ownership game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why, why watch YouTube videos of dogs and cats when you have one? Exactly. And they do weird stuff. 
like so I, I also tried to explain that to him I'm like when it's your own dog you get to know their personality you know it's not like visiting someone's dog or dog sitting where they're just you're feeding them and they're there I'm like there are expressions and personalities and you just you can't know it until you have one. Oh, it's so good my, my dog walks backwards into the kitchen <laughs> sometimes like and then walks backwards out of it like, it like it's like he's terrified of me or something I'm like I've never hurt you ever. Like I've never <laughs> like hit you or kicked you or done any of those horrible things right. that people sometimes do to their pets. And who you know, knows where these things come from, from, right? <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? Anyway, that that's awesome. And I'm so glad yeah. he like loves his dog. Like absolutely. It's been fun. Yeah. All right. So moving into your story and your journey um let's start off I mean sounds like you like always wanted to have kids in your life um it was something that you knew you wanted yeah you know I don't know that there was ever a time when I questioned if I wanted kids or not I I think that it always just felt like a given as part of my life that I would have children um I you know I was that person who before I was old enough to babysit I was like the mom's helper with the neighborhood kids and I nannied in college and um, I tutored at the elementary school and just a lot of parts of my life revolved around children that it never even occurred to me to think about it as do I want this or not. Uh, I just always felt like this was supposed to be part of my life, that children would be part of my life. Um, And for that reason, I think it's made it particularly hard to have to at this time in my life have to think about, well, what does a child free life look like? Where is, you know, where am I able to find joy in the possibility of a child free life? Um, because you only, you only really fully understand that it's not a guarantee. Once you start struggling to have it, you just kind of assume if I want them, I'll have them. If I don't, I won't. Uh, but then you actually get to the point of struggling and you have to think, well, God, what is, what is the alternative life look like? Um, but I, you know, I definitely, uh, didn't consider life without children until I realized that it's not a certainty. Yeah. Yeah, And I think obviously, because we, we get taught, you know, you do the thing, you have a baby, it's (laughs) it's the way we do it. You know, you have the the mom, the dad, the kids done. Um, and, and it's just that kind of like, you know, the American dream or however it's uh, phrased, you know, that you get married, you have a house, you get you have kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that sometimes that's that's really helpful to people, you know, if they just I just I just randomly had a baby. Um, but obviously, you know, not everyone's like that. And there are a lot of um, issues that we can have that that will prevent that. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I think there needs to be a little bit of education there, like just so kids are prepared. Because like, yeah, you know, even even if you just say, you know, not everyone has an easy time. Not every because then then there's like that little oh, I do remember at school they said not everyone mm-hmm. finds it easy, and I I fit into that group. Okay, you know, I agree, and I think that we do often hear, uh, you know, the concerns of if you wait too long, it could be difficult. Um, But we don't hear about as much the difficulties, regardless of when you start trying, you know, I, I was 31, 32, when we started trying. So I was not yet at that age where the issue was because I was so much older. Um, I also think that had I known more about these concerns, I would have listened more to my symptoms that I've had my whole life. I was, you know, I was diagnosed with endometriosis in my thirties, but when I was 10 years old, I had such painful periods that a doctor put me on birth control at 10 years old, rather than exploring, this might be something else. This might be something deeper. And so had in my education or in the medical field, we were having these conversations, um, I might've looked into it sooner. I might've, you know, given myself more opportunities. So yeah, I think it would be phenomenal if our health education was less 
fear-based. If you have sex, you will get pregnant and a little bit more <laughs> medically based. Yeah. Or, or action-based even. I mean, mm-hmm. a, a lot of women have a similar so- story to you with their um, periods being not right. think, you know, maybe they were getting some kind of like weird symptom and then their, their doctor just puts them straight on the pill. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know. And then it just masks those symptoms for years. It doesn't it doesn't make, it doesn't heal anything. It just masks what's going on. Yeah. Like I spoke to a lady the other day and she has um, depleted ovarian, um, as what you call it? Depleted ovarian reserve. Reserve, that's it, reserve. I was going to call it syndrome, but I was like, I don't want to call it a syndrome. <laughs> um, but yeah, reserve. And I, I'll link her her um, interview below. But she she had problems at the age of 16. And she said, like, it really wasn't right. Something was not right. Um, but they put her straight on the pill. And it turns out that she actually has, she's going through menopause. And she'd been, she they reckon she probably was in, that premenopausal, like going through it from the age of 16, because it wasn't until like her twenties where she came off that they learned that, yeah, you, you're actually going through this sort of menopause. And how frustrating. And she- Imagine the options she could have had <sighs> if they had, you know, treated this with seriousness. I think that it seems to be the only bodily system that I have ever been able to think of where when you go to the doctor and you say, this bodily system is not working and I'm in pain, they just give you something to mask it. As opposed to if I went to the doctor and I said, you know, I'm my heart hurts every day. They would say, wow, let's, let's do an echo. Let's find out what's wrong with your heart. Let's figure it out. But when I say my uterus hurts, they say, mm, yeah, Advil. <laughs> it's like... We, we just don't treat it the same way. And I feel like that's a real disservice to people with female reproductive systems, because if we think of it as only worthy of making children, we're not actually treating the health conditions that we have. Yeah, I think a lot of the time the problem is um, how, you know, it's been diminished. Like they're like, oh, well, it's just PMS. It's just, yeah. you know, a period. And because of that sort of, I don't know, like, yeah di- diminishment like just making it out like it's nothing um and we're just like it's in our heads you know it's hysteria um right. I think yeah it just gets dismissed you know it just they just don't think it's that important I mean I had terrible periods when I was younger um I'm after hearing so many stories I'm so shocked that I didn't have problems with my first um three kids because I had terrible periods, absolutely terrible. Like I would get like jelly legs, I'd throw up. Like I was so sick that I couldn't even go into school and and do the things that everyone else was doing on their periods. Like I was just really unwell. Um, and I went on the pill to balance out hormones because I was like emotionally a wreck. Like I was yeah. so just unwell, um, like in a pit and everything. Like I was erratic. Um, but yeah, none of that gets put down to you having an issue. It's like, oh, well, you're just a teenager and you got some hormones and you know, you're just emotional. Yeah. Instead of what it actually was, which was there is a real issue there. I still don't know yeah. what it is. I have to, I'm gonna have to look into it after this one because um only now have I actually gotten more education for doing this event and talking to so many women that I actually do have an issue and I didn't I didn't even think of it because you don't. You just, right. yeah, you get yeah, told. We're dismissed that. so easily. Yeah. You just get told it's a period and you're like, well, like, I mean, I know plenty of people who have periods who are fine and don't have any problem. Right. Why am, why am I, you know, <laughs> in agony and can't move and can't walk or throw up? You know, why is that? <laughs> so, yeah. And I think that like we often um, we're afraid to to admit how much pain we're in because we start to think, well, maybe I'm in more pain because I'm not as strong as other women. Um, I remember thinking that often as a child as well, because I was a child when this was happening. You know, I I was not at the maturity level to know like this is not in my head. Um, so I really thought, okay, I'm just not as strong as my friends who can handle their periods. You know, I'm just not as capable of handling my period. And we tell ourselves that so that we justify being dismissed. Yeah. And I think other people will view you that way as well. They'll look at you like, well, 
you know you just can't handle it you know whatever because they have it easy because their periods are fine because their yeah. body clearly is in sync um mm-hmm. but yeah it's it's definitely um yeah a diminishment and a and a dismissive kind of behavior when it comes to talking about our fertility our functioning um uterus <laughs> essentially so how did you go into um sort of wanting and trying for a child um well the natural the fun way at first you know? <laughs> I think that what's interesting is I think most people go through a phase when they start trying where you're almost too scared to admit you're trying so you say something like well we're no longer trying not to get pregnant <laughs> you know which by definition is just trying to get pregnant like we're having unprotected sex um but it was probably about six months into not trying to prevent pregnancy that we realized wait shouldn't this have happened you know shouldn't this have happened on its own yet um and that's when we shifted to well let's actively try let's do you know the temperature checks and the calendaring and like the looking at the mucus and the whole thing and you start I slowly became more and more obsessed with those details. Um, And it it was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't so long. I was under 35. So at this time, the doctors say, try for a whole year before you see anyone. Um, And then I did get pregnant. And so we thought, oh, it just took a little while. No big deal. Uh, Went into the doctor for, you know, the seven, eight week ultrasound. And at that time, They said, you know, it's not where we think it should be at seven or eight weeks, but maybe some people get their calendars wrong. Although I'm very type A and my calendar was not wrong. I could point to exactly the like time, place and position we had sex to make that pregnancy happen. (laughs) Um, But they, you know, they say it's, it's not where we think it should be. Let's come back in a week. So we went back in a week and had another ultrasound and, and the doctor was more concerned this time. And this is during the pandemic. Uh, where my her, my husband couldn't come in. So he's sitting in the parking lot on Zoom. We're like FaceTiming or something during this whole thing. And I'm like, I don't know where to put my camera, like at my face, down here. Like, what do you want to see, dear? <laughs> uh, but at this point, the doctor is a little more concerned. And she said, you know, I'm seeing, you know, we're seeing parts of what we're supposed to see, but also something else is on this image. And she didn't know what it was. And she said, it could be a blood clot. It could be you know, so it could be a a twin that didn't make it and some, you know, something else. So again, we're going back in a week. And I think this is an experience for a lot of people with pregnancy loss is the, we assume that it's this like sudden moment, right? Like you see it in the movies where you're walking around and then suddenly you have this moment. But for many cases, that's not it. It's almost like a slow torture. Uh, so it was like maybe four appointments, uh, you know, one every every five or six days where we kept going in and there'd be a little growth or the blood would get a little higher, but things weren't looking right before it actually. And, you know, the whole time you're sitting there, you're like, I'm pregnant, but I'm not. I'm in limbo. What's happening? So we never really got to feel the joy in it until finally there was an appointment where she was like, this is this is not going any further. Um, this, you know, didn't make it. And here are your options of what to do next. Uh, Because it was a missed miscarriage, my body was not recognizing that it was not growing. So I had to decide either to wait and have my body recognize it, which could be, I mean, it could be weeks. She said people have, it could be a month um, to take the medication at home or do the DNC. So that was, you know, that was my first pregnancy loss, but still at that time, I felt very much like, people kind of shrug their shoulders because it happens. There was a lot of, well, miscarriages happen. Um, Almost like trying to make me feel comforted. They'd be like, yeah, a lot of women have miscarriages. It's like, why would I feel comforted that a lot of us have this horrible thing happen? That doesn't make me feel better. That just makes me feel like a lot of us are sad. Uh, It also is why the doctor didn't do any tests, didn't push to say, you know, let's test Let's test the um, tissue. Let's, you know, take some blood tests. Let's see what's going on. Instead, they were like, well, it was your first pregnancy that we know of and this happens. So try again. So 
that was probably my first regret in the process that this, you know, thing happened, this traumatic thing happened. And I, I just said, okay, and we'll try again. Um, and frankly, it wasn't until the third miscarriage that insurance would even cover pregnancy loss testing. So, you know, I had a second miscarriage and still they were like, all right, this is really unfortunate. This is really bad luck. Now you fall into a different data bracket, but I actually didn't have coverage yet to do a a whole gambit of testing. Um, So it wasn't until the third miscarriage that finally we were being really taken seriously with doctors, that insurance would cover testing, that we really, you know, stopped trying naturally and said, there is clearly something wrong. And that's when we started looking into specialists and seeing what our options were to figure out what it was. Yeah, I think a lot of the time when people say about the first one, um, like I think they think, well, you know, it could have just been a fluke, you know. So that's why they brush it off so much. Like I, with my first miscarriage, I was like, like really broken, obviously, about it. And I, I said to my husband, it's this, it's that. And he's like, well, no, we don't know. And he's like, it could have just been something random genetic, like, that we just don't know and we won't ever know because we didn't get anything tested. So, you know, that's done. Um, So then I was like, okay, but then the second one happened. And then I was like, well, what does this mean? Because the first one can be a fluke, but the second one can't be. You can't like have like a random occurrence happen twice, like in a row. So this needs to be, this is something else, you know? And I think once, yeah, once you have the second one, you're like, okay, can we do something about this now? And then they're like, mm-hmm. no, because yeah. who isn't enough? Uh-huh. You- right. <laughs> we need you to have one more trauma before, <laughs> or we'll dust it out. <laughs> yeah. We need you to lose one more baby. And you're like, seriously? Yeah, it's infuriating. Oh. It's so frustrating. Yeah. And I mean, what, what did you choose? Like, I mean, that's a crappy choice like all of us who are faced with this choice are like oh yeah Yeah. you have three choices well they all suck can I have something (laughs) else yeah um I I chose to take the medication and and pass uh pass it at home um in hindsight I would have probably done the DNC so we could have you know they would have tested the tissue then but it wasn't really an offering to test the tissue to me I only know now that I could have asked for that. And you, I also, in my subsequent miscarriages have still at some of them taken the, uh, taken the medication at home and collected the tissue to get it tested. Uh, the reason I wanted to do it at home was because I wanted control over when I want, I definitely knew I didn't want to just wait and just have to like go about my life and wonder when this was going to happen. I already had felt like I'd been walking around with this, loss inside of me for weeks and I couldn't do it anymore. Um, Very grateful that I live in a state that has this medication readily available. You know, I I think often about how there are a lot of places in our country where women don't have that option and it doesn't matter what the medical reason is. Pharmacies just aren't carrying it anymore. Um, So I had the option and I'm glad I could do it at home because I was able to schedule it for Friday. You know, I, I took the medication on a Friday I had the weekend. I I really appreciated that I could just be in my home, in my safe space with with my dog and my husband and my mess and my shows. And, um, you know, I, I'm glad that I did it that way. I, I think that it's it is a hor- there's no good option. Whatever people choose, they're all terrible. Uh, this was the one that felt most comforting to me. So that's what I did. Um, my, I've had, you know, five miscarriages in total, uh, and two of them pass naturally three of them. I've had to take the medication and I've opted the medication every time the last one with was a IVF transfer miscarriage. And we did still retest the tissue. I collected that and we tested that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's such a, it's such a horrible choice to have to make, um, I feel very grateful. I I live in a place that has that choice though. I know that not everywhere in the world is that choice available. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is so true. Um, how were your natural, um, losses? Uh, the first one, um, was really hard. It was actually the day of my sister's wedding. Uh, so I knew that it was, I was home in Chicago visiting family 
And this was my second pregnancy. So I was still a bit of the mindset like, oh, okay. The first one was a fluke and I'm pregnant again. And we, uh, you know, we brought home little jumpers to give to my parents and surprise them. And they knew I'd been pregnant before and they knew we'd been trying. So we got a video, you know, it was the first time I got to try to, it was the first and last time I got to have an exciting announcement. And while I'm not done trying, I'm never, I know that I'm never going to have an exciting announcement again, because there will never again be a pregnancy for me that I feel excited and optimistic about. I'm terrified of being pregnant again. Um, but you know, we went home and I was doing blood draws while I was home, while I was visiting to check our levels, just to make sure everything was increasing. And the last one I had done had taken a, a real stark decrease. So we spoke to my doctor and they said, you know, this one's, you're losing this one as well. Um, but because I was in Chicago visiting family for this wedding, I couldn't really do anything about it until I got back home to California. Uh, so this was on like Thursday that we found out we were losing the pregnancy. Saturday was the wedding wedding when it actually ended up happening. Um, my family, you know, is, it was also a very small wedding. It was like 20 people in a backyard because it's during, you know, it was post vaccines, but still early enough in the pandemic that this was a big gathering. Uh, so, so yeah, I, you know, I went to the ceremony and, uh, we were at the reception and I, felt the, you know, strong cramps. It was more the scenes you see in the movies, the strong cramps start coming. And so my husband and I left then we went back to my parents' house and that ended up being the night. So that was, that was really hard. And it was, um, it was definitely the moment where I knew something's wrong with me. Something is wrong or something is wrong that is causing this. I, like you said, I'm, no one can be so unlucky. This can't just be bad luck. Uh, so that was, that was really tough. And then the other one that I lost naturally as well was, uh, it was the early, it was the shortest pregnancy length. The next pregnancy was also a natural loss, but I was only pregnant. Not that at any length, it feels okay. Um, but because it was five weeks, it, uh, the physical part of passing was easier. Of course, there's never a time, no, no length where it doesn't feel emotionally very hard. Um, but it was early enough that a, a DNC was not going to be necessary. Uh, yeah. So that one happened on its own as well. And then it was the next two were later on. The next two were through IVF transfers. Yeah, um, I've heard a lot about the IVF transfer ones where because you're taking hormonal treatments, if the, you don't find out, you know, um, early, you're, yeah. it's going to be like 11 weeks, 12 weeks before. You yeah, my uh, the medications were we're continuing to tell my body that it was pregnant and everything was fine. Yeah. So it, you know, it was only through ultrasounds that we knew things weren't fine. Yeah. And does it and take, you, again, you could stop taking the medication, but it could be weeks, even months before your body knows it on your own. And yeah, that's what was, that, about. you know, that was not for me, the waiting, the not knowing when not for me, I'm not a very patient person. <laughs> uh, honestly, the, the way it is probably I, I'd say it was the worst part for me. You know, I got told that I was losing the baby and that I was going to lose the baby because um, the baby hadn't actually grown and formed properly. Like it, it was, it you know, if it was there, it was there, but it was just like a sack. Um, and then they said, you know, it should be three weeks. It was not three weeks. Yeah, I went from the 5th of May all the way until the 20th of June. Oh. So I was like, When's it happening? Like it's horrible. It's there horrible. Was times, there was times where I started bleeding, and it was on and off, on and off, on and off, and I was like, "Am, am I done?" Like that was so okay, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that was like that wasn't a heavy period. That was like a light one. Like uh -huh. that was like a normal period. <laughs> and yeah. then, and then it, the the egg. But yeah, I think the important thing is um, that we remember that it's a delivery. Did you have anyone tell you that, that, that you were? No. Oh gosh. And I tell everyone now, I probably tell people at times when it makes no sense to tell them, I'm like at a dinner party, I'm like, Hey, did you know that you have contractions when you miscarry? <laughs> and, and everyone looks at me and they're like, we were talking about Game of Thrones. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Back to that. <laughs> but, um, I, I was not at all warned about the pain. I was not at all warned that you have contractions. 
that you actually have labor pains. Um, I was definitely not warned about how messy it would be. Mm. Uh, you know, especially the later ones. I mean, at one point during my last one, I just got in the bathtub and sat in the bathtub for hours. Cause I was like, there's no, I was wearing adult diapers. I had towels down and it was just too messy that I was like, this, this is absurd. I feel like I'm trying to like sop up a drain that just keeps running. So I just got in the bathtub with a book and that's where I waited. Um, and I, you know, I just wish I had been warned what to expect. I wish I'd been warned what to see. I think that it would really, really help people with the trauma if they knew what it was visibly going to look like, um, no matter the stage, because, you know, you have this moment where it happens. And then I realized I didn't plan for what to do next. And so I'm like, well, do, do you flush it? Do you throw it out? Do you, you know, what, what happens next? And all of those questions, I just feel like someone, a nurse, someone, especially my first loss, could have and should have sat with me and said, this is going to be a really hard conversation, but you should know what to anticipate. Um, because I think that there's so much trauma that we hold in, in the unexpected and not knowing that this was going to come. And, and so I do, I do try to let people know like, Hey, no one wants it's first of all, knowing what's going to happen is not going to jinx it into happening. You know, a, a pregnant woman knowing what that experience is, is not going to jinx her but it could help prepare them a little bit better for what to expect. Yeah. I feel like everyone, every woman needs to be handed like a pamphlet even like, you know, not even told, but like a pamphlet, you know, cause they yeah. give pamphlets about breastfeeding and the safety of not co-sleeping and all this stuff. So why can't they give pamphlets about, okay, you're pregnant, yeah, you know, um, but this is what happens if, you know, it doesn't work out. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, because like we were told it, it is common. Yeah. So why don't we know what that feels like, what that physically feels like, what it looks like? Like if it's so common, why is it also so unknown? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think a lot of it is known as just people don't want to talk about it because it is not positive, you know? Yeah. Um, and you do get handed pamphlets as well that like go through the different trimesters and what to eat and what not to eat and so I feel like, you know, you they could, they could have pamphlets where they explain yeah. what's going going to happen to you and they just don't, you know. And, and a lot of the time, you know, you're right. It's like a long, drawn-out process. It's not like an instant, oh, well, I just miscarried. You know, it, it's a, it's a, oh, crap, um, you know, this is going on for weeks because most yeah. of us have to go and get checked and checked and checked and checked. Oh, no, there's no growth. Yeah. Absolutely. It is weeks. And I think that um, now that I am a part of this incredible supportive community of people who have had losses or infertility or going through IVF, it's, it's such an incredible community that I wish I had at the beginning because it helps you feel so much less alone, but it's also information. Um, for example, I, I've been connected to this uh, woman in the community who was, you know, she found out she was going to be uh, losing her pregnancy and she didn't know what to expect. And because we've developed enough of a closeness, this internet friend of mine, um, I told her, look, send photos, call me, whatever you need. So she did, she would text me photos of, of you know, her underwear and say, is this it? And I, because she wanted to collect the tissue to be able to test it, to understand her options, understand what happened. And so I was able to say, I'm like, you know what? I think actually that's, that's not it yet, but it's probably going to be tonight. So stay in, you know, prepare for that because, because we're not quite certain. And then I showed her, you know, photos I had, I'm like, Hey, this is kind of what you're looking for. And it's, horrible horrible conversation but her and I are so close now because we had who else are you going to talk to about that who else are you going to ask that question and I, no one wants to google that because you're always going to see way worse too you know or whatever you google is going to be tenfold as terrifying as just talking to a friend yeah um, and you might not get that extra information as well that kind of like puts it into perspective and that you know is that person okay are they alive like did they yeah. go to the oh, hospital? Because right. some of those exactly. scenes are awful. Um, I love that you took pictures. I took pictures of my sack. 
So yeah. I guess, I mean, that's that's all we have. That's all the evidence of yeah. that. I, I honestly, I, I didn't the first time and I did the next time because I, you know, and I even said to my husband, I'm like, I don't know why I'm, I, I feel inclined to do this, but I need, I feel inclined to memorialize that this happened, that this pregnancy was real, that this was real. Um, and then it did just become information for other people, (laughs) you know, it did just become a tool I could share. And I could say, I was able to say to them, you know, this is what my loss looked like at eight weeks. This is what my loss looked like at 12 weeks. You're at, you know, 10 weeks. So expect the size, something in the middle. And, um, I, I just think that it's already scary and hard enough without needing to feel alone in it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that might be why you felt the inclination to, to take those photos is because, you know, you were going to need to use them to help other women and, that's a beautiful thing. It, you know, it's a horrible thing that we go through, but we can do beautiful things with, with the pain, with the, with the, you know, ugliness of it. Um, I mean, even down to, to me taking a picture of the sack, I'm sure there's someone who's going to be delivering something like that. So I can, you know, if I ever come across someone who's got a blighted over a blighted ovum, I can be like, well, this is what it looks like when it comes out. So be prepared. Cause you feel kind of horrified and like you just gave birth to an alien. So, (laughs) (laughs) but it it is crazy. And I mean, I, I had researched before um, when I found out I was miscarrying and I looked up the different options and like, I'd heard horror stories about the pills. So you're like one of the first people I've spoken to who didn't go to the hospital um, I've got to say though, the scene that you've described, like a lot of the time they say, go to the hospital, if that's the amount of blood that you have, yeah. but I'm guessing you didn't get told that either. I, I, uh, I was, I did end up calling our clinic, um, during one of them when it was so much and lasting so long. And then we started the monitoring of it. And, you know, if they basically said, if, uh, if it continues in X number of hours, we want you to come in, uh, if it, you know, continues, but you know, they did also say, um, this can happen. And after you, after you pass the tissue is when we really want to see the bleeding stop. So if you're bleeding a lot right now, your body is doing what it's supposed to be doing and try to pass. Uh, it is one of those things though, where you're, you're kind of questioning everything. You're like, is this supposed to be how it's supposed to happen? How long is it supposed to last? But at the same time, I, every single time I, you definitely do not get used to miscarriages. Um, I, I at least have not gotten used to miscarriages. Uh, If anything, I get less and less used to it. They become more and more traumatizing. And now I'm frankly terrified of a pregnancy. Uh, But you're also in a little bit of a, I don't know, I'm, I wasn't, in a logical headspace. I think I was trying to disassociate from what was physically happening. So I would sit in the bathtub and read like a fantasy novel. You know, I would read something totally different that I could escape into and pretend everything happening from my waist down was not happening. Uh, so I, I tried to distract myself. I tried not to pay attention to it. And frankly, the the contractions were painful enough, the pain of it that I don't think you as easily can think about the medical need to be like, hmm, do I need to go to a doctor? I think I was really just thinking, why go to a doctor? The loss is, it's lost. It's done. What are they, what are they going to (laughs) do? You know? So you forget about your own health a little bit, I think is what it was. I was like, I, I just came from the clinic and they told me that there's no longer a heartbeat. I don't need to go back to have them remind me that there's no longer a heartbeat. <laughs> like, we already did that. Um, the idea of going back to another doctor after all of that, I was like, no, I'm getting in the tub. This is where I'm going to be. <laughs> you can find me here. Oh, oh uh, it's so, it's so, it, I'm glad we could laugh about it, but also be horrified by it. <laughs> yeah. It's terrifying. Like, and when we're going through it, we, yeah, you're right. You don't think about your health. Like yeah. I've spoke to a lady who she passed out. She yeah. passed out and her husband went, you know, we need to go to the hospital. And she was like, no, I just want to lay down. 
Yeah. And he's like, are you sure? Like, you know, you, you're bleeding a lot and you passed out, you know. And she's just like, no, I just want to lay, lay down. And this was the first time I'd heard of someone who had passed out from the amount of blood who didn't go to the hospital. And I was just like, okay, so then what happened? And she went, I just, I just rested and, you yeah. know, I just... I felt better after some time, but yeah. And I was like, why didn't you go to the hospital? And she was like, to be honest, like I was just so tired and I just wanted to lay in my bed and I didn't want to go to the hospital. I relate to that. You feel so defeated already. Um, It kind of feels like, like you already lost the game. Why would you go back and play some more? You know, like I, I just felt like I, the loss has already occurred what are you going to try to save? And you forget that you go to save you. You know, we we forget about that in those moments. We forget that we still have ourselves that we need to take care of. Um, so yeah, I think that we're definitely not making always logical decisions when yeah. we're going through that. <laughs> I mean, I would say, look, if your husband says, let's go to the hospital, just have it in your mind to just say yes because yeah. you don't know what you look like, but he does because he's looking at you. Yeah. And if he's yeah. terrified, then that's that's worth you going in regardless, even if it's more trauma for you and it's going to be crap because it probably will be. But yeah. um, at least you you give him that peace of mind and, you, and also, you know, hopefully you get looked after in yeah. a sense. Um, but I think so too. I think that... It, it kind of goes back to the lessons we should have learned, you know, when we were 10 and we had such painful periods, like we have to stop telling ourselves this is normal, that it feels this way. If you have a lot of blood loss, yes, there's going to be blood loss during a pregnancy loss. But if you start to think, or your husband or someone, your partner starts to think this seems abnormal, just go check it out. Just go check it, check it out. Take care of yourself. Um, I think that it's it's just too easy for us to say, well, this is a horrible situation. So of course it's horrible because it you don't want it to get worse. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's that's often a fear as well. Like you don't want to make it worse. And there are a lot of horror stories that come out of the hospital and and all that. Um, but yeah, I think we still have to think about our health. Um, but yeah, it's it is hard to do that when you're in the moment. So Absolutely. Um, I can understand that too. So where are you guys at now? Are you, um, are you having a break or are you trying IVF again? Yeah. So we are right now doing a couple months of Lupron Depot. Um, so after my last miscarriage, which was in, uh, in September, that one, they were all hard, but that one was hard in a different way. That one was hard because, um, it was a tested embryo the pregnancy was looking beautiful. We, I mean, we'd been doing treatments for a year. And I think one thing that's really frustrating is we assume that when you have an issue, they're going to do some tests, diagnose the issue, solve the issue, and then everything works out. But even at this time, I have done every test under the sun. I have had surgeries. I have, I mean, I've seen reproductive immunologists. There's like, I've done it all. And I've learned a lot of things that are wrong. Yet it's impossible to ever say, this is wrong, so here's the solution. Um, so like discovering that I had adenomyosis and endometriosis diagnosed, but we don't know for sure that every pregnancy loss was because of those. So you, you know, you're kind of always throwing spaghetti at a wall and hoping it sticks. Um, but this last pregnancy was tested embryo, uterus was beautiful, beautiful looking uterus, everything was going well. Uh, and then I... I got a bleed. And what really devastated me was the bleed had nothing to do with the endometriosis, with the embryo quality, with the endometriosis, with all these other things I've learned that I have as issues. I, you know, I've discovered a Sjogren syndrome and all these other things. That bleed was bad luck, just dumb luck. It happens in pregnancy. And most of the time it goes away on its own but it didn't. And so it led to another miscarriage. So what really devastated me with that one was we finally had everything working the way it was supposed to. 
And I thought that we were in this. Um, I was allowing myself to think about names and we knew the gender. So I, you know, I was, you really imagine what that life is going to be. And then to lose it for an entirely new issue that has nothing to do with anything I had going on. Oh, it just, it, it took a different emotional toll on me than the others had. Um, so I'm very type A. I did what I always do. I got very proactive. I said, we're going to go into every other test. And I did a tour of, <laughs> I did like a, a tour of consults. I spoke to five different doctors that are all very extreme in their views in different ways. Um, I really like my doctor in my clinic, but I had a bit of a feeling of like, we put this in your hands and trusted you for a year and still it's not working. So we're going to see what else is out there. And I talked to some real extremists <laughs> and different ideas. Um, but all of it kind of came back to that loss was bad luck, but let's test all these other things. We learned a lot more. I had a, a hystero to remove um, some fibroids and cysts and test again. And uh, all, all of that being said, we got to a point where we realized we needed to do this Lupron Depot to address the endometriosis. So you can't get pregnant while on Lupron Depot or it's very, very, very slim chance. And you don't want to, cause it wouldn't be safe to be pregnant on it. Uh, so we've been doing that for a few months. I'm at the end of it now. I've had my last injection. And so I'm just waiting on my period to start in which time I'm going to do a month of uh, treatment from a reproductive immunologist. So we've discovered, you know, you know, immunology, some doctors believe in it. And some doctors say it doesn't really have evidence of correlating with fertility, but it can't hurt. So we're kind of at this point of like, we're, we're going to try it. And so we're, uh, I'll be doing IVIG. I'm so fortunate that our insurance has agreed to cover it. It's very expensive otherwise, but because I discovered that I have this autoimmune disorder, they're covering it for that, not for fertility. Cause again, fertility, they're like, oh no, we don't cover anything for fertility. Oh, but you have this other issue. Sure. We'll cover it for that. Um, so I just you know, I discovered through the testing that I have this autoimmune disorder. Um, it allows us to have some coverage. So we'll do a month of IVIG and some other medications. And hopefully after that, uh, I'll be able to transfer again. Um, in, in truth, it's not really a break because I'm doing all these medications and I'm doing all these fertility things. But what feels like a break is for the first time in years, I'm not actively trying to get pregnant through IVF or through, you know, natural pregnancy. And there is something that feels a little bit, uh, like a breath, like I, I can breathe a little bit through that. Um, because I am very afraid of getting pregnant again. Of course, that's the end goal. The goal is, well, the end goal is a baby. I wish I just didn't have to, you know, go through the pregnancy part to get to it. But yeah, you know, I work very closely with my therapist on this fear. We are talking a lot about, uh, how, the fear of pregnancy does not mean that I'm no longer wanting to have a child. It just means I have a lot of trauma from these last losses. So it's hard for me to even consider the pathway to get to that baby. Um, so I think that this last, yeah, this last loss was the first time I've become so afraid of being pregnant again. Uh, yeah. So this time has been good to really focus on therapy and address that while I'm doing all this other medical stuff that hopefully will make the difference. Yeah. Um, I I've spoken to a few ladies, uh, recently who just talk about this sort of whole holistic approach of your mind, your body, your soul, like just really hitting everything. And, and I mean, that's what you're talking about. You're talking about, you know, you're actually covering the medical things and yeah. you're covering your mind as well, because that, that then will, you know, help, help your soul feel more connected to your body and you feel more grounded um and I think yeah like it's it's totally reasonable to be to be scared you know um I think detaching fear from pregnancy and and seeing it more as you're scared of the trauma rather than the pregnancy you're not you're not scared of being pregnant you're scared of the trauma that comes absolutely that. so it's not the pregnancy yeah, it's not. it's the uh it's knowing that of all my pregnancies, they've ended in such traumatic ways. Um, yeah, I'm afraid of that part of it again. And and I, I completely agree. I think that while I know it's a medical issue, 
My losses are medical issues. This has nothing to do with, I wasn't thinking positively enough. This is not an, you know, this isn't that. I do want to have the mental strength to go into the pregnancy. I want to have that strong foundation. So I think the hard thing with taking time, I think a lot of people might relate to this is time lost is also terrifying. We're just getting older and I can't help but feel like every month that passes is one less month in my life to spend with any child I might have. Um, So while I know that my mind and body need a little bit of time before I get pregnant again, I also hate the idea of waiting too long to get pregnant again. Um, Because gosh, time has never felt so important as it does when you are wanting to have a child. (laughs) And uh, um, years are long, but months are very short. A month goes by very, very quickly. Uh, So yeah, so it's, it's the time has been really good. And I think that it's making me stronger. I know it's making my body healthier as I'm doing this Lupron um, and I'm doing the other medications. But at the same time, I want to go into the next transfer feeling stable, feeling good about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And feeling like, you know, you're ready because otherwise, yeah, you're just, you're going to be just having a really rough time the whole time, you know, and and like you said, you're living a life and you want to be able to live it in a way where you're, you're feeling okay. um, You know, and hopefully, hopefully these things will work out. I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying for your rainbow. Thank Um, you. And I, I really hope this works out and goes goes the way pl- of like you've planned it. Um, I appreciate that a lot. And I, I think so much of it just... is, you know, we, we take things uh, right now, we're taking things one process at a time. This month, my focus is the Lupron and the immunology treatment. And next month, it you know, will be focused on transfer. Um, But it really does help a lot for me to not think so many steps ahead. What what am I doing to care for my body and my mind right now? That's what I'm focused on. Uh, And I I think that helps a lot because, gosh, spiraling, we spiral. We definitely can spiral very easily. Um, But it's okay. You know, what I've also realized is it is okay to be afraid of being pregnant. It is also okay to have moments where I wonder, is it, you know, is this all going to be worth it in the end? Because it's all a gamble. We don't know if any of it will work. We don't know, you know, where it's going to lead. Um, so, it you know, it's it's all those worries are totally normal. And it doesn't mean that if you worry or if you're scared, that for that reason, it's not going to happen to you. You know, I know that I don't have to think positive. I can just feel and think however I'm feeling and thinking. And it will not have an impact on the next round because because that's not how the universe works, you know? So um, I think, you know, and this community is so amazingly supportive because what's very neat is you do get to meet a lot of people who have their rainbows. You get to meet so many people who, uh, who would go through all of this for years and years and years. And there's always someone who's done it, gone through longer, who's had more losses, who's had it harder. There's always someone that comes out the other side. Um, and finds joy in life. And so I, I really appreciate getting to know people who find joy on the other side of things, however that looks for them. Yeah. And I, I've been speaking to a few um, different cases where um, they went a different route, like they went like adoption or uh, surrogacy. And they said, you know, it's fine. Like I feel so much better just because like, because I'm at this other side now I'm content you know, and even if it takes that, you can still feel that contentment and feel okay about having gone through what you've gone through in terms of you, you got a certain result, you know, and and although we go through horrible things and obviously it would be better not to, um, we wouldn't be who we are today if we hadn't, you know, so even if right now you don't feel like this is worth it and like, you know, is, is it worth it? Just remember that the person you are right now wouldn't have been if you hadn't and as horrible as that is in reality um you know you're also a really beautiful person you know I don't know who you were before this but you're you're lovely you're really beautiful and every woman I meet is so beautiful 
And I, I get so like emotional like every time I have these interviews now, especially at the end, because it's like we're gonna say goodbye to each other. Yeah. Um, but I just, yeah, I I have so much love for you guys. And I I know we all kind of feel it for each other. And we just we just want that other person to have that rainbow. We just want that that content yeah. for them. And Absolutely. I it, uh my my husband saw me refreshing Instagram recently and he said what are you what are you looking for and I said oh someone I know is about to announce the gender of their of their baby of their pregnancy and he goes I thought you hated pregnancy announcements on social media I was like oh no this is a this is an IVF warrior she's one of our people it's different I'm like I do hate those but not not this <laughs> one this is our people and I was yeah. it was like I'm I'm waiting on it I'm excited for it because because we have a bond that, you know, we never knew we were going to need. No one ever wants to need. But gosh, I think we just have this little piece of the, it's like the one piece of the internet that is kind and loving and supportive. And I'm so grateful for it. Yeah. And and you're right. Like <laughs> whenever someone's doing like a birth announcement, a pregnancy announcement, if it's a fellow lost mom, you're like, oh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else, you're like, <laughs> like I'm so glad you're having a baby and that's beautiful and wonderful but yeah like, you're like oh yeah. so <laughs> and there is always that like that little bit in your head like it's so unfair and like I'm so envious oh, of you right now um but when it's a fellow lost mom you're just like yes yeah <laughs> it's it's like a win for all of us <laughs> yeah yeah but then they're like again like during pregnancy after loss you don't feel that win that you don't feel that win there there's no win until until that baby's born and i think that's the case with most women i don't think i've talked to anyone who who felt that win and even after the baby's born sometimes you can be a little bit like <laughs> just i have gotten that way with with so many things i just want to put everything i love in a bubble and say yes. you're not going anywhere <laughs> oh no i keep telling ladies like and now i check my husband's breathing you know it wasn't something i did before um <laughs> yeah yeah it's you just you grow and you become more compassionate and it is um it's a it's a strange strange change but we we learn to love it I hated it at first I hated changing I hated this whole journey um but then I just I met so many of you and I I started to love it I started to love you guys I started to love myself more and you can you can really see the beauty in in you guys and you know in yourself you know you start seeing the beauty in yourself and then you accept yourself a bit more because like you know it's very easy to hate on yourself <laughs> especially if you're blaming yourself for things that there's a there's so much self-loathing so much blaming we have to process through and um I find what I often on my Instagram handle where I connect to the community I often will share uh you know from other people's stories that they have where they feel like it's their fault so that we can all rally together and be like, that's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. Cause I would never look at someone and say, this is happening to you and it's your fault. Yet we do that to ourselves. Oh yeah. Um, and that's what, you know, I, we have to remember, we would never think that of someone else, but we can't help but feel it of ourselves. So we have to be in this community to always remind one another and lift, you know, lift one another and hold one another on those days that just feel especially heavy. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I've spoken to like fertility coaches, women who coach women through loss and through these things and, and they still have the same thing. They have the same guilt. They have the same blame, self blame as the rest of us. Uh, and they're, they're sort of quoting that, you know, don't, don't blame yourself. And it's like, you know, and it's, it's, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're only human. We are yeah. Only. And I think it is a complicated blame because I, you know, one thing that I've said very honestly with, with my partner, with my therapist is I know that I didn't do anything wrong. However, were these embryos in someone else's body, they may have made it. And I think that's the part that's really hard to balance for me to grapple with. Um, and that's where it's about for, it's like, we don't blame ourselves because we didn't actively do anything wrong, but we also do need to forgive ourselves. And we need to know that, you know, our, 
our love and our bodies and all of that, that matters too. Um, so it does, it is both about not blaming yourself, but also forgiving yourself in ways that you need to forgive yourself too. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, I think that's sometimes this sort of dangerous thing about IVF and things like that, because you can test the embryos and you, you can know if they're like perfect, you know, scientifically. Um, so it, it does, I think, add that extra layer of complication um and it's the same when you get an embryo like when you get um a loss tested and they're like oh it was perfect and you're like well what happened then because it's not here you know and I think that can sometimes make it harder but um yeah and um you you know forgive your body and um yeah and my doctor also is you know we talk a lot about how no you know doctors don't like to admit this but the science is not perfect The tests are not perfect. They can't test for everything. They miss things. We can't test so far. The science is not as far as we would like it to be. Mm. So there's just so much we don't understand yet. So whereas we want to go in and say, you know, here's the issue, here's the solution. There aren't easy solutions right now. And there aren't even ways to understand every issue right now. Mm. Um, Yeah. yeah. So even, yeah, I even know like when we, we have all PGT tested embryos, but even after the loss, I had it retested because we know that they can't catch everything. Um, so we're like, well, let's double check. Let's see if they can see something else. And uh, yeah, I think those those steps aren't always taken either, but yeah, certainly yeah. Uh, this is just an amazing community because I do know meeting people like you, meeting other people who've gone through this, I, I just, it reminds me like, wow, these are wonderful, beautiful, thoughtful people who will be and are the most wonderful parents and mothers. And so this has nothing to do with a universal, you know, desire to not have you be a mother. This is, it's, it's just about, it's a little harder for us to get there than other people. Yeah. And I think it is really easy to like, be like, oh, is this, is, is this my punishment? Am I being punished or something? And and you're not, you're not, yeah. it's just sucky. It's just something yeah. that's, crap that's happening. And unfortunately right. it's for you. Yeah. Uh, I, one comparison I often give that I'll, I'll leave with is uh, I have really terrible eyesight. I wear contacts. I was born with bad eyesight and never in my life. And it's again, it's something I was born with. My mom has bad eyesight. It's just, you're born with bad. Some people are born with eyesight and they need glasses. And never in my life have I said, gosh, I, I need glasses. I must not deserve to see. I don't deserve vision. I've never said that. So how come when my eyeballs don't work very well, I'm like, yeah, this happens. But when my uterus doesn't work very well, I'm like, gosh, it's, it's gotta be me. It's gotta be something I've done. And that's just ridiculous. We're, we are born and some of our parts don't work as well as others. And that's every part of our body. Um, and it's not a punishment. It is just bad luck. Just like my needing to wear glasses is not the universe saying I don't deserve to see. I deserve to see. I just need glasses. I deserve to be a mom. I just need some medical assistance to do that. So I, I try to remind myself, even when I put in contacts, I'm like, see, this is fine. You deserve to see. I love, I love that comparison. That's such a good comparison. Yeah, like <laughs> oh, I don't deserve to see. Yeah, like <laughs> it would never cross my mind. Oh, I met someone who couldn't smell, who had no sense of smell. Interesting. Yeah, so I thought, and she, she, oh, she had beautiful lunches. She just, she'd pack her box, and it would just be this beautiful, like visual, like <laughs> thing. And I'd just be like, wow, your lunch looks amazing. She's like, yeah, I can't smell. <laughs> so like, then she made it look good. Yeah. She's like, I so I, just, I enhance other things and, you know, make it pretty. I love that. Yeah. I thought it was wonderful. I was like, that's that's really awesome that you do that. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, everyone was always really jealous of her lunch. And then she's like, yeah, I can't yeah. smell. And then they're like, oh, that sucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's like, I'm jealous of how yours you smell yours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I wish that I had your nose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the thing is as well, she had a really cute nose. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. <laughs> I was like, well, you look cute and I love your nose. And she's just like, thanks. It's all decorative. She's yes. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, thank you for that last note. Because I think that I was going to ask, you know, what would you say for a final note? But that, that's amazing. Like, I love that, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I hope I re- it resonates with everyone listening because, yeah, like, 
why do we blame our bodies? We don't blame them for not being able to see properly or or other things, you know, and, and here we are blaming ourselves for not being able to have what we want. Yeah. And I think that's another thing as well. My husband always says, um, just remember it's what you want. Like it's, it's, you would never have made anything happen. Like if you had a choice, if you were given a checklist, you'd, you'd tick every box, you'd cross every T, you'd dot every I, you'd do everything in your power. And he was like, so don't ever blame yourself because you, you just can't, you know, if you knew you would do. Mm, I like that. But um, thank you so much for speaking with me. Yeah, and, um, thank you. I oh, this was so you, nice. I hope to see you in the lives and um, talk with you again. Um, it's been really lovely. I feel like we need to have like group chats after this event so we can like. Yes, aim. that will be so great. I can't wait for it. Well, thank you. Thanks. I'll have a wonderful afternoon. You too. Bye. Please note that all speakers, including experts and professionals, express information, views and opinions that should not be used to diagnose, treat, cure or prevent any medical conditions. If you have a medical issue, please consult a qualified professional. Speakers voice their own views, opinions and conclusions, and they may not reflect the views, opinions and conclusions of other speakers. Ella Rose, The Joy of Sunflowers and its sponsors may not endorse all or any of the views, opinions or conclusions expressed.